Victor, get the light. That's not the light. Oh, sorry. Hi, C3 kids. How are you doing? Good. Can everybody say something a little louder than that? Are you good? Oh, look at our friends are here. We have Ranger and Penny and Pip. Hey, Sister Leslie. Hey. Yeah, we were just out for a walk, and we wanted to stop by and say hello to all the C3 kids. Hi, guys. Everybody say hi. hi. Oh, my gosh. Are you guys glad to see Penny and Pip and Ranger? Oh, so exciting. Yes, and you know, I've been hearing about how these kids have been worshiping in church, oh. and I'm so proud, and I'm sure that Jesus is even more proud. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We was in the back, and I was looking. I was looking out from the back, and I saw these kids out here worshiping, and when they took off running, I got so excited, I wanted to come out of the back, and I almost took off running, too, and said, <laughs> Hallelujah! Oh. Yeah. oh, my goodness. Well, you probably should have. They probably would have liked it. Well, listen, this week we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and all that he did for us on Calvary. That's right. And you know, you've all been learning about the cross, and Jesus' resurrection. And did you know that Jesus said that if he would be lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men unto him? Mm -hmm. And you see, that scripture, Jesus was talking about going to the cross and being lifted up on the cross. But he's not going to be lifted up on the cross no more. Mm -hmm. He came off of that cross and he rose from the dead. And today, when we lift him up, that's how we lift him up, with our praise and worship like these kids were doing. And he said he would draw all men unto him. That's right. They're doing a great job too, aren't they? Yes, you guys are doing a great job. And it's so exciting to be a part of a church where the kids are involved in the service and where they're worshiping so much. That's right. And you know what else is exciting? What? I heard that Captain Ross is having an Easter egg hunt today. Oh. And so he told me that if any dogs came, that he would not only hide some Easter eggs, but some dog bones and some dog treats. Hey, Pip! Why don't you come with me and we'll go to the Easter egg hunt together? Come on, Pip. Bye, C3 kids. Right, everybody bye. say bye, bye. Ranger. Bye. 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 Oh, he's still worshiping. He's feeling the spirit. All right. Well, hey, Penny. Hi. Well, weren't you going to go to the Easter egg hunt? I, I would, but I'm just a little sad right now. Oh, why are you sad? Do you, want, do you want to talk about it a little bit? Well, we've been going through the resurrection eggs in Sunday school and mm -hmm. talked about the whip, spear, cross, crown of thorns, and the tomb where they laid Jesus' body. I know. It's so exciting that you guys are learning about all of it. It's a very powerful story. But when I think about all the bad things that happened to Jesus, my heart is just so sad. Sometimes it's all I can think about. Oh, well, you know, here's... Hey, Peter, how are you doing? Hey, Sister Leslie, how are you? Oh, good. Listen, you know, Penny, she was just telling us about how sad she gets when she thinks about the cross and Jesus dying. And, you know, you were there when it happened. Do you want to tell us about it a little bit? And maybe oh, yes, yes, Penny? the Easter story. I was there for that one, and I can tell you all about it. You see, Penny, the week started out so exciting. Crowds of people followed Jesus around and were amazed by him. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the people laid down palm leaves for him to walk on. Mm -hmm. wow. But during the Last Supper, Jesus began to tell us about his death. It was the saddest thing I'd ever heard. And then it all happened. Just like what you were saying, Jesus had to appear before a court and a judge, and they convicted him and sentenced him to death. Mm -hmm. And they crucified him, even though he'd done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. They did all of those awful things to him, and we watched it happen. But you know, Penny, that's just one part of the story. The most powerful part of the story is that they put him in the tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead. That's right. I've seen a lot of miracles in my life, but that was by far one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. Yes, wow. Penny, isn't that exciting? Does that cheer you up a little bit? 
Yes, but I still keep thinking about all the sad things that happened to him. Well, you know, Penny, sometimes I think about the sad things too. Do you remember the rooster in the resurrection eggs? Well, that rooster is in that story because I, I am the one who denied him three times. I get sad too when I think about it. But when I think about all that Jesus went through to die for my sins, it just makes me want to live better and do more for Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I turn that sadness into motivation and do more for him. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead so that we could have a wonderful and joyous life. Wow. That's true, Penny. See, Jesus wants you to be happy, and it's good to remember the cross but he wants us to celebrate Easter and how he rose from the grave. That's right. You know, I think there's an egg hunt I'm missing out on with my friends. Will you go on and you have fun? Oh, well, you know, I think I'll go with you, Penny, because after the Easter egg hunt, I have to preach the Easter message to all the people on the puppet ship. All right. Well, everybody say goodbye to Peter and Penny. Bye, kids. Bye. Bye. Come on, Penny, let's go. Wow, they are so excited today. Okay, I have a question for you guys. I have a couple questions. So Jesus wants us to remember. What is it we're supposed to remember? The cross. That's right, the cross. The but uh, that right. But He wants us to celebrate. Easter. What is Easter? When He rose from the dead. That's right. And you know, I have another question. How many days was Jesus in that tomb? Every one of you guys know that. That is so exciting. We have Donald Duck up here, and I bet you Donald Duck even knew. How, Donald, how many days was Jesus in that tomb? Three. <laughs> Show Donald Duck to everyone. Let him see. <gasps> there's, <laughs> there's Donald. Okay, does anybody have any questions about the Easter story? Anybody, anybody want to ask some questions? I think, I wonder... What makes you think that? Huh? I don't know. <laughs> can you tell I'm stalling a little bit? <laughs> okay. Kendall, do you have another question for him? <gasps> oh. Well, I guess we have one more friend that's coming. Surprise! <laughs> Y'all thought I was Easter Bunny. It's not the Easter Bunny, it's Victor. Yeah, it's you me, it's us. me, Sister Leslie. You it's us. so good to be here, and it's so good to see my good friend, Sister Brindle. Sister, yeah, Sister Brindle. No, it's Sister Kendall, you know this, Oh, Victor. that's right, Sister Mendel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, and uh, and, and also my good friend, Sister Janie McGuire. Yes, Sister. She took off running like there was a sale at Goodwill just a minute ago, yeah. Victor. Yeah. Oh my word! But oh, but you know, oh, 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 oh! I heard, oh, I heard someone say something about preaching an Easter message, and you know, uh, yes, Pastor yes. Craig wants me to preach today, and and since Easter is my favorite time to preach, I have a message all prepared about the Easter story, sister. Okay, Nancy. really, Victor? Yes, You're yes, I got a message all, message all prepared. Yeah. Uh huh. You okay. see, you see, on Easter time, the reason I love to preach on Easter is because I love to preach about good old Peter Cottontail. No, Victor, you see, no. Peter Cottontail was hopping down the bunny trail. No, and, uh, no, no, that is not it. No. Well, what do you mean that's not it? Peter Cottontail, he was one of the 12 disciples, no, you know. Peter Cottontail was what? not a disciple. But wait a minute, he, but he was just out here. No. Peter Cottontail was just out here, Sister Victor, Nelson. no, Victor, what? that was Peter, the disciple <laughs> of Jesus, not Peter That was Cottontail. Peter the disciple? Yes. Not yes. Peter Cottontail? No, not Peter Cottontail. Oh. But you know, but but are you sure, Sister Leslie? Because I'm, the I'm Bible really says sure. that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he did. and then it says three thousand people had an Easter egg hunt. No, that, that is not what the yeah. Bible said. They did not and have can, an Easter egg. Can you imagine all no. of that okay, candy? Oh, yes, I want some candy. No, Victor. Okay, listen, Victor. That is not what Easter is about at all. It is about Jesus. And how he died on the cross, right. and they buried him in a tomb. Oh, yeah, they buried and, him in a tomb. Yep, and right. everyone was so sad they thought it was all over. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. 
That's right, Sister Leslie. Jesus That's rose right. from the dead. I, I knew yes, that. I was yes. just testing you, just oh, like Peter. You were testing me. Yeah, okay, I just yeah. wanted to see if you. But you know what? When you talk about Jesus rising from the dead, uh -huh. that reminds me, Sister Leslie, of my favorite song. It's my favorite song. Y'all, y'all even sing it today during church. Well, uh, okay, what song was that? Oh, oh, it, well, it was my favorite one. You know, it was. Uh, oh, it was the one that goes. Uh, was it? Was uh, it the anthem? <gasps> You mean the song that goes hallelujah. Yes. yes, that song. Is that is that it? That's your favorite oh, song? No, but I do like that song. You want me to sing a little bit more of no, it? No, 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 Victor. Okay. Was it maybe Amazing Grace, maybe? <gasps> Wait a minute. No. No, that's too slow. I do like Amazing Grace. That's a good song. I like to hear it on the harmonica sometimes. Yeah, I hear it's a good harmonica yeah, song. That's a good harmonica song, but that's okay. not it. This song was a fast song. I oh, can't... it was a fast song. Okay. No, I, wait a minute. Let me see if I can. <gasps> I know. Brother Rick can help us out. Brother Rick, hit the music on that Brother, song. You're going to sing it, Victor. No, oh, no, oh, Victor, we don't have Wait a song. minute. That's yes, it, Sister no, Leslie. That's the song. He got up. Yes, oh, he Sister Leslie. When I hear this song, something comes over me, no. and I have to say, got up. Oh, oh he got up, and I want to take off running, Sister Leslie. Oh, oh, Sister Leslie, he got up. Oh, 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 got up. Oh, oh, I shouted my hair down, Sister Leslie. Oh. Oh, he got up. What do you say, kids? Can, can you oh, yeah. praise the victor? Can you get up praise? Come on, kids. Get on up. Oh, my. Victor's coming to preach about Peter Cottontail. Oh, man. Wow. I just want y'all to know, I saw everybody that was scared. You can't hide. It was all on your face. Y'all jumped. Oh. Uh, Man, well, happy Easter, C3. Oh, I am excited about today's message. It, it seemed like I wrote and rewrote and rewrote some more. I was telling the church last week that it becomes the biggest challenge for me is on holidays, Christmas, um, New Year's, Easter. Because this would probably be, if you don't count the times I was evangelizing and just pastoring, this is the 20th Easter I've preached. How many Easter messages are you going to preach? How many different ways can you do it? And um, if I was lazy, and there's some things I'm lazy in, but preaching isn't one of them, I would just pull out one of the 20 and put a new name on it shake it around a little bit and give it to you, but I don't think that's fair. You come out not to hear a rewarned message. You came out to hear something that is, is relevant to what's going on today. Um, so Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 12, reading from the modern English version. Real quick, before we get in that, wasn't everything done with excellence? Did y'all like the video that went up on Facebook and YouTube? Wasn't that awesome? Uh, and everything the puppets did today, I'm so glad that they're, they're back. I don't know where the, the, the puppet ship was. Maybe it was in the Bermuda Triangle, but I'm so glad they're back. Um, and for those that are visiting us today, I would say welcome, but y'all made yourself welcome. Y'all were worshiping and running and jumping and uh, up at the front. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, when we started this church, Rick and I and our families, we, we talked about we want this church to be a church that we'd want to go to even if we weren't involved in it. I want this to be a church that I would go to even if I wasn't pastor. Because it's one thing to go to work, it's another thing to actually love it. And, um, so I'm so thankful that this could be a church where you could be yourself. And if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Church where you can come... <clears throat> Not perfect, but just forgiven. A church where you can worship and not feel silly. You can worship. and If you take off running, nobody's going to come out sideways. You're like, oh. um, if you take off running, somebody's going to follow you. I love it. I love that we are becoming a church um, that we've always wanted. The very best without all the politics. 
I pick out all the good stuff from each church I've ever been to, throw it together, shake it up, and that's what C3 is, not the politics, not the, uh, the man-made rules and all that stuff. So um, I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of this. Luke chapter 24, 1 through 12, reading from the modern English version, which is basically for those who go, what through all these versions, Pastor? This is the King James Version without the these, those, thines, thanks, can'ts, and shaints. It is about as, as good as you're going to get without the um, Elizabethan English. First one says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were greatly perplexed concerning this, suddenly two men stood by them in shining garments. As they were afraid and bowed their faces to the ground, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then the Bible says they remembered his words and they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and uh, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But their words seemed like fables to them. and They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves. He departed wondering in himself what had happened. I want to preach for the next few minutes on the topic, the most powerful words ever spoken. Would you pray with me and see what God has for us? Jesus, we love you. We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you all the praise. There is none like you in all the earth. And Jesus, on this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate, not, not just the promise, not just the promise of Christmas, but the proof of Easter. Jesus, thank you. That you're everything that you said you are, you were, and God, that you are faithful. Jesus, we come here. Remember, God, not with heavy hearts of what happened on a Friday, but God, we come with hearts filled with joy that we serve a risen Savior. And Lord, help us today to leave out of here realizing what the most powerful words ever spoken were. God, help me say a bunch in a little bit of time. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. The Bible contains various scenes from the life of the Lord in his last week before the crucifixion. You have the washing of the disciples' feet. You have the Lord's Supper, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And of all those scenes leading up to this one, seem to place Jesus at any place but that of a victor. He has been pulled from a place of prayer in Gethsemane. He has been paraded through a kangaroo court of false charges, and then he has been nailed cruelly to the cross, cursed, beaten, spit on, and mocked, hanging for six hours on a cross, bloody, lonely, desolate, and forsaken. His friends came and removed him from the cross and managed to put him in a borrowed tomb. And what looked like the end was really just the beginning. On Sunday morning, he defeated the bonds of death in the grave and came through it all. He is risen and the tomb is empty. Now, what I like about this story is the initial focus of the text is in a, of on a group of women. See, Jesus' mother was among the small group, but there were other women with her as well. Women perhaps related to him. Others that he had healed and blessed. But all of them had been lifted by his life and his presence among them. Notice it was the women who were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. Women were a very prominent part of the ministry of the Lord because of how he had lifted them. Their lot in life was not the best. You have to understand, we cannot read the Bible as 21st century North Americans. We have to realize the plight of the woman in Jesus' day. Women were nothing more than mere slaves. Jesus lifted the woman, women, uh, to the level of human beings. He refused to look at them as if they were simply material possessions of a father or a husband. He looked at them with great value. 
I challenge you, go anywhere in the world today where the gospel is not preached. It, it is absent. The, and, and, and the plight of women is deplorable. Human trafficking, places in the world where women are still just a mere piece of property, various forms of discrimination and psychological control. Anywhere in the world today in 2021 where the gospel is not preached, the plight of the woman is deplorable. There's something powerful. These women felt that there was something they owed the Lord for the way that he had treated them. The devotion these women caused them to want to seek out the Lord early on Sunday morning to anoint his body. They gathered spices that weighed almost 100 pounds, and they remembered the stone uh, over the entrance, wondering who was going to roll it back for them. But when they got there, the stone had already been removed. Then, to their great horror, the body of Jesus was not there. Fear settled over them as they thought that someone had stolen his body for some nefarious means. But, and as they looked up, they saw two angels who gave the question or posed the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He is the Lord of life. There is no grave that could hold him. He made the whole world, including the tomb that had held him. He had shown them the power of life over death on the earth. That This is the most powerful announcement that has ever been made on this planet. And here, there have been some great announcements in the history of man, but never one like this. The angels were simply confirming that every promise the Lord ever made would come true. And he meant that every claim that he made was going to be true. It meant that he has a, he's a living and a risen Savior. It meant that Satan and death and the grave was defeated. It meant that Jesus Christ will march down through the ages as a victorious ruler. It meant that he was a mighty conqueror. Luke 24, 6 says he's not here, but he's risen. But what we do is we just go, yes, Lord Jesus, he's risen. But what comes next? Remember how he spoke to you while you were still in Galilee. And the Bible says they remembered. It's easy to forget sometimes, isn't it? When you live for three days in the shadows, it's easy to forget sometimes when you live with hope that seems to be dead. It's easy to forget sometimes when you live with swollen eyes and heavy hearts from weeping. It's easy to forget sometimes we find ourselves like that. Mm, don't we? I want to take a few minutes today to remind you of what he said. He will be delivered into the hands of sinners, crucified, but he, crucified, but he will rise again. Don't forget the promises. Remember, along with those in our text, don't forget the promises. Stand on the promises. The promises are the things that are precious. How about the promise, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the earth. Uh, all things work together for good. My grace is, sufficient, is sufficient for you. On this Easter Sunday, we need to remember the one who defeated the grave. So, some of the most powerful words ever spoken is, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. But it's not long after this message from the angels that the Lord starts to appear to those who are close to him and begins to give each person a personal, powerful word. Mary Magdalene. Now, I was up this morning rewriting this entire message because I think Mary Magdalene deserves someone to champion her. Legends about Mary Magdalene abound. In fact, Mary Magdalene is probably the most well-known for false details and unproven facts in her life. Often she's identified as a former prostitute, but there is nothing in the Bible that backs up this rumor. Frequently people identify her with the sinful woman in the city that anointed his feet with, uh, with ointment and wiped his feet with, uh, with her hair. But there's no clues in the Bible text, uh, the identity of that woman, and no reason to believe that it might be Mary Magdalene. At times Mary Magdalene has been confused with Mary of Bethany, Lazarus and Martha's sister. But biblically Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene are two different people. Mary Magdalene is identified in the list of women who provided for Jesus and the disciples out of their resources. If anything, Mary was so blessed that she was able to fund Jesus' ministry. Mary Magdalene was freed from seven demons, but it's not clear exactly what kind of bondage she was freed from, whether it be mental illness, physical illness, sexual sin. We just don't know. She was the first one at the tomb that morning. For three days after burial, Jewish custom was to visit the tomb of a loved one. When Mary arrived at Jesus' tomb, she was stunned. The huge rock that was supposed to be the seal of the tomb was gone. Immediately, she went to get help thinking that someone had stolen the body. And after the disciples came and saw it for themselves, they went back home. Wait a minute. She went and got the disciples and showed them that tomb. 
and they went back home, only Mary stayed. Sometimes we give up on God too easy. If I was a preacher, I'd stay here for a month of Sundays, but I got to preach this whole Easter thing. But sometimes we give up on God way too soon. She went and got the disciples, showed them the disciples, checked it out, and then they checked out. They went back. Only Mary stayed. Mary remained the tomb, not wanting to leave the apparent scene of the crime, if you will. Somehow she could not give up. She didn't expect to see Jesus, but his persistent woman couldn't pull herself away either. She asked who she thought was the gardener, sir. If you have moved him, tell me where he is and I will take him away. One version says, I'll go get him and put him back. Mary was like, I'm going to lift the body of a dead man and bring him back. Mary, I can't imagine what's going on in Mary's mind. Have you ever tried to pick somebody up that was just dead weight? But she was willing to stay longer than everybody else and do the things that nobody else wanted to do. Once she realized who she was speaking to, when that gardener looked at her and said, Mary, once she recognized the gardener wasn't just the gardener, he was the master of the universe. It was Jesus himself. Once Jesus told her to go share the news of the resurrection, nothing could stop her from telling other people. Mary Magdalene has been called the apostle to the apostles. How many times have you heard that preached? Hmm. Like, never, because dudes don't want to say it. Mary Magdalene, stop downplaying her. You know, I don't care what the Da Vinci Code said. She wasn't married to Jesus. She didn't have Jesus' kids. She didn't kiss Jesus. She wasn't a prostitute. You don't know any of that stuff. All I know is that she went back and told the ones who should have been there that Jesus risen. She is the apostle to the apostle in her role in telling the disciples about the empty tomb. It's amazing. It's amazing what can happen to us when we hear the voice of the Lord. Just don't get so far away on this Easter Sunday that you can't hear his voice. Please do me a favor. Now more than ever, we need to hear his voice. But Jesus didn't stop with just Mary Magdalene. Now there was other women there as well. But let's look at this. Jesus has a word of revelation for Mary Magdalene. But for these women, he has a word of instruction. Instruction always follows revelation. His instructions are to go and give a message to the disciples. This world needs to hear the instructions that the Lord commanded and for us to give it to them. So he commands them. See, sadly, Luke paints this picture of the response of the disciples, which is far too close to the response of those in 2021. At the, the news seemed too good to be true. When the women went back and told the apostles, it seemed too good to be true. Their words seemed like idle tales, and they believed them not, is what the Bible said. But Mary Magdalene about to show up. <laughs> See, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, you remember those guys? Next, we find in Luke's account that the two men on the road to Emmaus were intercepted by Jesus. This is just as the same thing that happened to Mary Magdalene. He, they didn't recognize him. Jesus asked the question, why are you so sad? That's the question for these men. The questions that Jesus asked in Scripture are some of the most provocative that you will ever find. We talked about this before, but in the four Gospels, Jesus asked more questions than he answers. To be precise, Jesus asked 307 questions. He has asked 183 questions, and he responds a whopping three times. See, asking questions was central to Jesus' life and teaching. Why are you so sad? This is the question for the ages. Why? Because he never asked that question when everything's going well. He asked that question when we're under the weight of life. It's so funny. The Lord of glory comes to him and says, why are you so sad? And they begin to run the, the litany, this laundry list of every reason why they're sad. And they recognized him not. So Jesus started preaching to them as they went back on this seven-mile track, uh, walk back from Jerusalem. He reached one of the homes of the men and was invited for a meal. They began to break bread and he blessed it. And suddenly the Bible says recognition comes to these men. They begin to know him and poof, he vanishes out of their sight. See, to Mary Magdalene, it was a word of revelation. To the other women, it was a word of instruction. To these men, it was just a simple question. Why are you so sad? What about the disciples? His next appearance on Sunday night is shrouded with mystery. The disciples are there with doors and windows locked, shut, bolted. Why? Because they feared the Jews. If they had killed the Lord, they'd possibly want to kill him as well. And Jesus walks in and never opens a door. And suddenly he's speaking peace to them and great gladness, the Bible says, fills their hearts. But there was a missing man. Thomas, he wasn't there. Because he was absent. 
he missed one of the greatest blessings of his life. Oh, it would come later, but he missed the initial joy and peace the Lord was able to supply these men. There are a whole host of people just like Thomas in our world today. They miss out because they're absent from gatherings. It would be a week later before Thomas would be able to see Jesus, where Jesus says, feel my hands and my side, Thomas. You know, it's funny. Scripture never records that Thomas actually did. But just in a hushed and awed voice, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I plead with every absent Thomas today, see the Lord and his majesty and come to him. Or what about the seaside? His next, his next scene is at the seaside where a final miracle of a great catch of fish takes place. You know the story. After their meal on the beach, Jesus gets down to some very convincing and convicting business. Peter, do you love me? Three times this question pounds his very soul. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? His words said he loved the Lord, but his actions proved otherwise. That's probably the dilemma of the masses now today as well. Profess love, but no action. The transforming work in the life of Peter is obvious because years later, if you don't know the story, Peter would die a martyr's death as well on a cross upside down. Tradition says next to his wife, who he's comforting as they make the crossover from this life to the next. Something happened with Peter from denying him three times to being crucified next to his wife upside down. And in his, in his agony and his pain, he is comforting his wife because, baby, what I've seen is so much greater than this world. Something happened with some words, Peter, do you love me? The great question on this Easter Sunday is, do you love the Lord? Like, do you really love Jesus? Not if you started coming to church, not are you involved, not are you in the cookie ministry or, or the coffee ministry or the chair ministry, or not are you giving, do you tithe, do you, do you help out a little bit? No, it says, do you love him? Please never mistake stuff that you do for actual love. But see, to understand the power of God's voice, we have to take a quick look, if you let me, please. I know it's Easter and you got ham to eat or whatever y'all doing. Uh, but we've got to take a quick look at some, some of the attributes and examples given by Scripture. We see that the Lord's voice changes lives. Jesus began calling ordinary fishermen to follow him. And as promised, these men became fishers of men. The conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus, when the Lord spoke, Saul came to repentance with a name and a life change. Moses encountered with the Lord in the burning bush. Moses was called to free the Israelites. When God spoke, Moses began to see the impossible, be, the impossible become possible. The Lord's voice brings healing. When we speak of healing, we're speaking of physical healing. The account of the woman who touched the hem of his garment but we also see the Lord's voice bring spiritual healing. The story of the paralytic lowered, or paralytic lowered through the, the roof in front of Jesus. And Jesus told the man that his sins were forgiven. Not only can he heal body, but he can heal spiritually as well. The Lord's voice also brings emotional healing. Remember Hagar and Ishmael in the desert? She was at her wit's end. She was at the end of a rope until God spoke to her. The voice of God conquers evil, clearly demonstrated as we see Jesus sparring with Satan in the wilderness. And don't forget all those demons that begged to go into some swine. So how does all this fit in today's message? Man, we've worshipped and we've ran. Thank you for not knocking out all the cameras. We've, we've had a puppet show. We got people half scared to death. I was going to pray them back through the life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Victor. We have talked about the resurrection of the Lord. That why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Powerful. But how does all this stuff, Pastor, how do all these people fit today's message? When Jesus spoke to Mary Magdalene, he was speaking a word of revelation. When he spoke to the other, word, uh, to the other women, it was a word of instruction. When he spoke to those men on the road to Emmaus, it was walking with him. When he spoke to the disciples, it was the joy and peace. When he spoke to Thomas, it was a word remembering moving his doubt. When he spoke to Peter, it was showing love after failure. So on this Easter Sunday, he's not here, but he's risen. Can I be perfectly transparent? When I wanted to start this message, I thought these were the most powerful words ever spoken. I thought so. 
but he's not here. He is risen is the most powerful declaration ever spoken in the history of mankind. But the most powerful words ever spoken are the ones that Jesus speaks to you when and where you need it most. He's not here, but he is risen. It's awesome. But what do I do when I can't go on? The most powerful words ever spoken are the words that he can speak when you're fighting depression and come out of it. The most powerful words ever spoken and when you think your marriage is a mess and God says, I'll mend it. The most powerful words ever spoken is when you think you've gone too far and he says, you know, I will bring faithfulness out of your failure. The most powerful words ever spoken, I'm telling you, is not what the doctor says. It's the final word Jesus says where you are healed. The powerful words, the most powerful words ever spoken is what you need at the exact time. He's still speaking today. So I am thankful, praise God, that he is risen. But I'm thankful the Bible says he didn't rise and leave. He stayed for 40 days speaking some of those powerful words to his followers that they needed. Notice, all the people in our story did not need the same thing, nor does everybody in this room and those that are watching online. We have a cross-section of needs. Everybody's coming in here, and we've camouflaged our hurts. And we're here in this Easter Sunday, and you're in your Sunday best, and you're looking all good, and I appreciate it. But let's not kid ourselves. Some of you didn't come to hear another message. Some of you didn't come to just see, what's Pastor going to preach about today? Some of you are here because you know what? If God doesn't fix it today, I don't know what's going to happen. If it doesn't work now, if it doesn't work on this Easter Sunday, I might just give up on church. If God doesn't show me something now, I'll give him one more service. Well, welcome. This service he was waiting. He double dog dare you to walk into this place because there's enough spirit and power in this place to give you a word that you need so you can keep on going. So I don't know where you are. But I do know the most powerful words that are spoken about some of the words that you're going to hear in this service, not from me. In a minute, we're going to pray. We're not going to pray, oh, Lord, thank you. I don't get sick from jelly beans. Oh, Lord, thank you for my 45-pound Easter bunny chocolate. What we're going to do in a few minutes is say, God, you know exactly what I need. You know exactly what I'm facing. Maybe you like Mary Magdalene. And Jesus was the only one that saw her for who she was. And maybe you're going through some identity stuff where nobody appreciates you and nobody is taking you seriously and you feel like you're not enough. A word's coming to you. Or maybe you feel like the, the guys in the road to Emmaus where you're without direction and instead of being where Jesus is, you are walking seven miles in the wrong direction and you need some word to turn you around. Maybe like the other women say, you know, I just need a mission. All right, go tell somebody. Maybe you're like Peter and you failed, not just once, not twice, but man, you failed real good and you failed three times. And you need to hear Jesus say, you know what? I can turn your failure around. I don't know what you need. But if you're man enough and woman enough to actually pray sincerely, I promise you he's got enough to give you the word you need. So what do you say? Would you stand with me? He's not here. He is risen. Most powerful declaration. I believe that all the hell shuddered when, it, when the angel said that. That's great. But we had Easter last year, and you still have problems this year. That's great. Declaration is awesome. Praise God we have a risen Savior. But do we have one that will speak? Now listen, if you think you're going to hear an audible voice like Siri, if you think you're going to hear somebody like, uh, like Q from James Bond, I don't know what God sounds like to you. It's usually not going to be an audible voice. But when you begin to pray and ask for clarity, ask God for a word, there's going to be things that come to your mind so, so clear. Pay attention. Pay attention. Whose kid is that? They're trying to mess me up. Just cross over and keep going. God speaks. Don't look for thunderclouds and lightning. Don't fleece God and say, God, if it's really you, let four purple camels walk across the living room right now. 
No, when God speaks, it's usually exactly what you need to hear, exactly in the area that you're, uh, you're fighting with, struggling with, and it will become clarity. But the thing is, is that will you actually believe it? Because what the devil will say, that's just you. Well, if that was just you, you would have fixed it by yourself. You wouldn't need this service. Don't let the devil win on that. So as Todd sings, do me a favor on this Easter Sunday. Would you find a place to pray and say, God, I know you're risen. Powerful declaration, but what I need right now is a powerful word. And the most powerful words ever spoken are the words that you need when and where you need them. What do you say, C3? We take a few minutes before we enjoy the rest of this beautiful Easter Sunday. We find a place. We talk to God.